this is Nick Black and today I'm talking with actor Scott Wilson. Scott, thanks very much for taking time to talk with us. It's my pleasure. Let's start. When did you become interested in acting? Oh boy, that's a long time ago now. I was 19 years old. I hitchhiked out to California from Georgia to Los Angeles and I got drunk one night and ended up in an acting class. <laughs> Was it a specific goal? Did you come here to California to act? No, at one point in time I was going to be an architect and I was on an athletic scholarship. I got hepatitis and wasn't able to play any longer. So I was told if I had a relapse it could be fatal and decided to see some of the world. <laughs> Okay, and you started with California? Well, at the end of the class, this teacher came up and said, Look, I don't know what your problem is, but don't come back to my class drunk. So I went back the next week to apologize to him. I figured I must have stepped on his toes. He gave me a scene to do from uh, Eugene O'Neill, a one-act play called Long Voyage Home. And I went back the next week. It was a monologue, and I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So I joined a little group called the Attic Theater, about 13, 14 of us together for about two and a half years and we did plays and it was kind of like summer stock in a way while we were doing one we would be rehearsing the other and then we had workshops and classes and about five and a half years later going from one class to another and doing different plays I got my first film interview which was in the heat of the night. Doing these plays was it for money were you surviving? Well I did odd jobs uh, it was parking cars and pumping gas the cliches that all actors do in Hollywood I did all of those things selling magazines magazines door to door. The last play I did was been a while now too. It was Tennessee Williams play that he came out and worked with us for a couple of weeks and I had the pleasure of working with him. That would have been a great honor. It was. I know after opening night he came backstage with tears running from his eyes and he said at last I've seen the play done properly. <laughs> Which play was this? It's a play that he kept rewriting. He did several different versions of it. One was called Outcry and one was called a two character play and we made a composite version of those two. He had never been happy with those plays, so he kept rewriting them, rewriting that play. And so we made a composite of these two versions. He came out and we kind of polished it off. It was interesting. It was fun. We mentioned In the Heat of the Night before. That was a good way to start your film career in a classic. How did you get the role? How did you get the break, basically? I was in a workshop and I was doing like a 30 minute scene from Hat Full of Rain. And an agent saw me and wanted to represent me. And six months later, he got me an interview, and that was it in the heat of the night. Did you interview with Norman Jewison? First I met the casting director and he says, can you do a southern accent? I did it and he took me in to meet Norman and Norman says, can you do a southern accent? Everyone's laughing by this time. Then I went in and met Walter Mearish, who was the producer. He says, can you do a southern accent? Norman and everyone was laughing. So I got the job. One question, Scott. Can you do a southern accent? <laughs> <laughs> Only if I'm drunk. <laughs> Okay, so how was that? Pretty exciting. Yeah, it was a terrific movie for a young actor to get his first role in. I mean, it won what? I don't know how many Academy Awards, but quite a few. And that led to my being up for In Cold Blood, which was my first film lead role. You and Robert Blake are astonishing. It's an astonishing film, a very powerful film. Tell me a little bit about it. You played one of the killers, Dick Kickhock. Tell us a little bit about your experiences on In Cold Blood. Well, that was a long time ago now, too. Both of those films have survived the test of time. They're both, I think, considered classics. It was based on a Truman Capote novel that a lot of people say was a new form of writing. Recently at the USA Film Festival, they were showing both of those films, In the Heat of the Night and In Cold Blood, at the same time. And Norman Jewison and then Conrad Hall and Quincy Jones were all there. And so I didn't know which one to go watch. I'm staying out front smoking a cigarette. I look over and there's these little girls practicing their cheerleading moves or something. They recognized me from a film that I'd done recently called Shiloh, it's a kid's film. It's also, I think, for an adult film as well, the Shiloh movies. There are two of them now. Kids love these movies. It's good for the parents to see it with the film. It creates interesting conversation afterwards. Anyway, that's another story. In Cold Blood, they were very sought after roles, very intense. I suppose it would have been a bit of a risk on Richard Brooks's part to cast somebody in their second role, but you gave an amazing performance. He was a pretty evil character, but, I mean, there was more to it than that, of course. So how did you prepare? Did you go out and kill a few people? <laughs> <laughs> No, it had been a few years since I'd done that. No, I'm kidding. 
How did I prepare for it? Well, I had been acting about five and a half years before I got that role. Had you had a similar part? No, not really. I think every role is unique, but I did a lot of research. Of course, the book was very detailed and very into the psyche of both of these guys, and I read a lot of psychology books dealing with some of the abbreviations that Hickok had, check writing, stuff like that. And then you draw from the book. I think I was ready when I started working. As an actor, I felt like I was totally ready. Did you win any awards for that? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, the film was nominated for several awards, but neither Blake or I were nominated. It caused a lot of critics in this country to scream and holler, what's wrong with the Academy? But, you know, who cares about that yeah. anyway? I think too tough, because they've always been known as a rather conservative bunch, haven't they? Yeah. Well, I think one reason we got the role was that Brooks didn't want the audience to identify with the two killers. So he could have gone with a lot of very big-name people, but he chose to go with unknowns so the audience wouldn't anticipate anything or anticipate what they were doing or have any identification with them later. So that worked to our advantage in getting the roles. And that goes for Blake, too, because he was really a kid when he was working. He wasn't really a big name as a grown-up. But on the other hand, I think Brooks would like to have actually hanged us at the end of the film, so the movie would have been complete. <laughs> I mean, and the audience still wouldn't know that we were actors. <laughs> I mean, it was taking all the interviews that he did, he never mentioned my name once. It was always the boys and who he could have had in the movie. He had a, his own take on the movie. Let's go on to another interesting film. I saw this on TV late one night. It's a very weird yet interesting film called Castle Keep, one of Sidney Pollock's earliest films, Burt Lancaster. Uh, Peter Falk. Where was that, Scott? We shot that in Yugoslavia, mostly in Novi Sad. It's pretty close to Belgrade. That was a real castle? No, one of the reasons they shot it there was they wanted to build a castle that they could destroy, so it was really a facade. It looked real, but it had been built for the film. This is only, I think, your third picture, and you're acting with Hollywood legends like Burt Lancaster. How was old Burt? Was he an imposing sort of chap? I liked Burt. He was very nice. He couldn't have been nicer to me, really. I did another film with him after that, Gypsy Moths. I was in bed asleep one morning. I was a young man and out on the town the night before, and I got a call from him. He says, Kid, I've got a great role for you. I said, Who is this? He said, Bert. I said, Bert who? He said, Lancaster. I said, Bert, call me back. Let me take a shower and get a cup of coffee. He didn't want you to skydive, did he? No, that was it. That yeah, was the Gypsy Moths with Frankenheimer. But Castle Keep was fun. We were there for six months. There was the special effects guy, was I think Lee Ratzewell, who did the burning of Atlanta and going with the wind and he hated this castle that we were shooting in all the time saying he couldn't wait to blow it up. It actually caught on fire and was destroyed before we finished the film so they had to rebuild the castle for two shots. I mean it was expensive too. It was expensive. For its time it's really an inexpensive movie for what they're costing now. I quickly want to get on to New Centurions is a film that I really like. Another acting legend George C. Scott and he would have been another larger than life personality Scott. George was nice. I've worked with some terrific people right from the beginning. Rod Steiger, Sidney Poitier, Burt Lancaster, George C. Scott, right from the beginning. George was terrific. I worked with him later on, too, in, in Exorcist Three. But The New Centurions was an interesting film. I think it was the precursor to a lot of the cop shows that you're seeing now, the reality-based cop shows. Joseph Wambaugh wrote it, and he was a cop here in L.A. George was terrific. I used to play chess with George a lot. I want to get on to Lolly Madonna, Triple X. In fact, he was one of my teachers at film school, Richard Serafian. So tell us a little bit about Lolly Madonna, Triple X. Well, it was a lot of young actors with a lot of juice in that film. Jeff Bridges, uh, Rod Steiger again. Robert Ryan. And Robert Ryan, who I think his next to last film. Terrific guy. They knew that he had cancer, but then his wife developed cancer and died before he did. It was amazing. A seasoned Hubley, Joni Goodfellow, all kinds. Randy Quaid, a lot of very fine actors in that. Where was that shot, Scott? In Tennessee, around Knoxville. And did you have to do the southern accent? I had to do it. It <laughs> seems like I, most of my roles I had to do the southern accent. But not for The Great Gatsby? Not for The Great Gatsby, no. That was with Jack Clayton, who I loved working with on that film. And I loved working with him. He became a very good friend of mine. Met my wife at his house, actually. That 
it was a fun movie. Many years ago, I worked in an office and my boss went out to see a film and it was full. And he thought, well, I'll see what's showing at the other theatre in the same place. And it was a film called Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane. He knew nothing about it and he came out and the next day he came to the office and said, I've just seen the most amazing film. I never heard anything about it and it just will blow you away. I didn't see it because it went off so quickly, but I did eventually see it on TV. Totally unique film. Just coincidentally, I saw The Exorcist last night. It's William Peter Blatty's brainchild. Tell us a little bit about that. Another castle. Where was this castle? It's supposed to take place in the Pacific Northwest here in this country, but we shot it in Budapest, Hungary. It had to do with financing. I think Pepsi Cola had some blocked funds. That was during the Iron Curtain days, and they couldn't get the funds out. They co-financed the movie to get the money out in a film can, in essence. It's a terrific film. That film has two different titles. One title is Ninth Configuration, and the other one is Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane. It's been released under both titles in various places, but it has a cult following. Occasionally here, they play the film in Westwood at midnight on Saturday night, and I've never been, but apparently the place is packed, and people sit there and holler the lines at the screen before they're said. I get letters, and occasionally someone figures out how to call me from universities, and someone will have discovered the film, and they see it 30, 35 times in a month. I mean, it's amazing. It has a real cult following. Scott. You've worked with a few Australian directors. One of them was George Miller, not Dr. George Miller. George Miller and The Aviator. Yeah, we shot that in Yugoslavia, too, actually, in Patia, close to Trieste. But that was interesting. It was after World War One and an aviator pilot, you know, male, male guys who were flying mail from around the world, around the country. With Christopher Reeve. Well before his accident. And also, you worked with a Melbourne lady called Nadia Tass in Pure Luck. I don't think it did too well. I thought it was pretty funny myself. I did too. Who knows why an audience tweaks to a film. I think you make the movie and enjoy it while you're making it and whatever happens after that happens. <laughs> she hasn't been back to Hollywood, I think. I don't know. I want to get on to a couple of films that you did with Krzysztof Zanussi, which you shot in Poland. How did you get to know Zanussi? I was at a friend of mine's house one afternoon and there were several people there and Krzysztof was one of them. We started talking. The next day my friend said that Krzysztof wanted to do a movie with me and I said I didn't know he, he knew I was an actor and he said Wilson he's seen everything you've done so we talked that afternoon he said he had two ideas and he ran them by me and I chose one that I liked particularly because it sounded like I could work with the actress Maya Kamaraska that he uses in a lot of his films and nine years later we got the film made <laughs> But it was a nice film. We shot it in Poland during martial law, and it was quite an experience to be there during that period of time. Totally different than any experience you may have had living in the West. You being a foreigner, did you have to go through extra checks, and, you know, were they suspicious of you, the authorities? Uh, my room was bugged. I was followed. I mean, there was no question about it. I doubt there were very many Americans on a Russian military base during the Cold War. Well, you might have been a spy. Well, the, you know, we went in, and I had to lower my head and put my hands over my eyes and, you know, it, it was interesting. We won the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival with that movie. Then the other Zanussi film was a film based on a play that Carol Wojtyla wrote, who is now Pope John Paul II. We had an audience with him. He wrote the play about the guy who was Adam Yalovsky, who was his inspiration for following his own vocation into the priesthood. You know, he lived from 1845 to 1917. was a successful artist who came in contact with the downtrodden, the homeless, and it had a profound effect on him. He was torn between should he devote his time to his art or should he devote his time and energies to the homeless. Ultimately, he had a nervous breakdown. He came out of it, gave up his art, became a monk, and devoted the balance of his life to the homeless. We had two audiences with the Pope. We had one in Krakow prior to the premiere. He didn't see the film. Then we had a screening for him at Castel Gandolfo at his summer residence. That was quite an experience. That's amazing. We're running out of time, Scott. I just quickly just mentioned a few great films and looking through your resume I mean this consistent quality there Scott are you one of the few actors that know how to read a script there's so many things that go into a movie I mean you can have a fantastic script you can have a great cast and a terrific director and for some reason it doesn't go I think I know what a good script is yes but that doesn't guarantee anything great actors doesn't guarantee anything or a great director it doesn't guarantee there's so many elements that go into making a film yeah it's a lottery but I 
I feel that I've been lucky with the people that I've worked with. That's the key. If you're working with people that are proven that they're good, then you've got a better chance. Well, there's no better than the Pope, is he? <laughs> right. Well, he's a remarkable man. I may be going to New Zealand, as a matter of fact, to screen the film, have benefit screens there, and maybe it'll jump over into Australia. Let's hope so. I just want to quickly mention some great films that you've done recently, like Flesh and Bone and Dead Man Walking, but let's talk about Way of the Gun, Christopher Macquarie's debut. Of course, Christopher Macquarie is best known as the writer of The Usual Suspects. Tell us a little bit about the film, Scott. It's a very interesting script. Every character in the film is flawed, except the unborn baby. <laughs> but it's a very interesting film. It's on the surface very violent, but at the same time, I think it makes a statement against violence. Well, Macquarie's been doing interviews where he's sort of been saying that as well. Has he? I haven't read many of his interviews, but that was what I thought when I read the script. Again, usually you have someone who's kind of a hero in a piece, but there are really no heroes in this piece. They're all flawed people, and we're all flawed in life. But I think it's a very well-made film and very well acted. Just quickly want to ask you what you're doing at the moment, Scott. I just finished working on Pearl Harbor and played General George Marshall. I did a lower-budget film called Don't Let Go. It's changed titles. It may change again. With Catherine Ross, that was fun. I've wanted to work with her for a long time. And Bo Hopkins? And Bo Hopkins was in it, and it was a lot of fun. Well, Scott, I want to thank you very much for taking time to talk with us. Thank you very much, Scott Wilson. Thank you.